I, I think we should uh, probably uh, jump in now. We, we were pausing for a moment for Zoom to um, let everyone connect. Um, and uh, there are actually a few kind of organizational things to say at the beginning of this before uh, Gaston Cabaret, who um, is here alongside uh, me on my screen anyway, um, uh, and I will have a bit of a discussion. Um, the first thing to say is it may be that the discussion is just between Gaston and me because um, uh, Zacharias Kunuk was to join us and yesterday um, that did seem set up, but he's uh, not here yet. And you know, he, he uh, arrives, we'll certainly bring um, him into this discussion. Um, if not, there is one uh, degree of compensation, which is J Jamie Chambers did a, a kind of rehearsal discussion with Gaston and um, Zach um, a few days ago. And that will be available. In fact, it will be sent by email to everyone who's booked a, a ticket um, for, for this uh, virtual event. Um, I should also say that this uh, Zoom is being recorded um, and that uh, there will be uh, uh, captions, transcribed captions. Um, you'll get the link to, to bring them up on your screen via the uh, chat column in this Zoom picture. Um, I think that's uh, how it's going to work. Um, what I was planning to do um, with Gaston, with Zach, if he um, uh, is able to come, um, was to talk a little bit about some of the wider issues raised by um, showing uh, these forms of cinema inside the uh, folk film gathering and, um, you know, where these films uh, come from in a kind of cultural uh, and social sense. Um, uh, move from that to talk about the forms uh, of storytelling that um, have developed from uh, the cultures themselves, oral, oral storytelling into um, and uh, uh, adapted into uh, narrative uh, film and the uh, features that have been shown in, in, in the festival this year. Um, and uh, perhaps in more detail uh, about a couple of the films, um, certainly uh, Gaston's Budyam and uh, maybe Wen Cooney as well. And actually, even if uh, we don't have Zach with us, I think it might be interesting to touch on um, some elements of uh, his film, because you saw The Fast Runner, didn't you, Gaston, yourself? So we can perhaps um, touch on that, especially in the context of the extremely dramatic and um, serious uh, events uh, occurring in Canada uh, with a small C, as I think the First Nations um, put it, um, at this very moment. So we can... Um, uh, we, we we can perhaps end by a discussion of that, um, which within the frame of an hour and a half maximum um, should allow plenty of time for any uh, questions um, that come from uh, anyone out there. Um, it's a little bit like transmitting into the dark at the moment, but if any of the participants in the Zoom call um, have any uh, questions or thoughts or issues uh, or um, things that you want to put to Gaston, please um, bring them up in the chat column and we'll have enough time to ask Gaston to uh, discuss that, I'm sure. Um, so the, the first question uh, I was going to ask you, Gaston, is this uh, question of uh, how in your mind when you develop and begin producing a film, um, how you conceive of the audience that that film is for or primarily for, because maybe there are many audiences, but when you're making a film, how do you think of the uh, audience that you're making it for? Well, uh, since I'm living in a, in a uh, in a country, I am. Uh, I grown up in a in a 
society, a community. So my first, my first uh, uh, will, when I am uh, in the process to start writing the script, is to find in my own uh, own uh, way of storytelling uh, what is going to attract my people. You know, so I think. Uh, like for most of the artists, uh, I, I first want to speak to the people around me. Uh, you know, in my family, my, my, uh, my city, my country, and my continent. But by doing this, if my film is able to speak to those, to those uh, different uh, cycles of uh, audiences, I believe it can also talk, it can speak to people around the world, you know. It's, well, it's, uh, it's... I, I think to be, to be universal, uh, any piece of art needs to be born a precise place, I believe. So the, the paradox is that uh, it's through a starting point in the very close community and building outwards that actually you make something that um, people in completely different uh, um, situations, cultures, societies can can relate. Yes, I strongly believe in that. You know. And the, the stories uh, that you develop and shape um, in when Kuni and Budyam, for example, that they have grown up within um, that you've heard uh, within the community. Yes, and you yes. change change them a lot. Not really, uh, because uh, the the story is really rooted uh, 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 in a local local place, you know. So, you know, what is interesting in your question, because presently I'm still working on the third part of Budia, of Wenkuni, Budiam, and the third part uh, is it's a real challenge because I am trying to, to find a way to, uh, uh, to surprise my people with the story. The story will be, will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, completely linked to my culture. But in the same time, I know that my culture is not static, you know. And uh, what am I going to to say? How, which new destiny or new? Uh, sequence of destiny shall I, uh, uh, should I give to Wenkuni? So his uh, story remains uh, linked, you know, to, to my people. That's a real, with new characters, you know, uh, coming in, the, in the, the narrative I am writing. And it's very interesting because I know many people have already an idea uh, on what should be the third part of Wenkuni. While myself, I don't know exactly. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm still working on that because they, they, uh, they, uh, it would be interesting to, interesting to make a workshop, bringing some people to write the third part of Wenkuni, if I, I could do that. But of course, uh, it would not take that, uh, that uh, way. And I, I am alone with this uh, challenge. And I, 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 I want really to say something unique, singular, uh, uh, unpredictable to myself and to my people. In I think, way. I mean, uh, yeah, you should get those people to put their projection of the third part into an envelope and seal it. And then um, in what I hope will not be too long when we see 
I love that phrase, the sequence of destiny that you um, um, describe yes. in a, a third part, because um, things do have to be trilogies. Yes. Anyways, um, we see how uh, yes. different it is. But can and I also just... because I know that uh, yes, no, yes go, after me. you, go, Gaston, go after you. Yes, I, I was saying that, of course, when I am going to do this third part, uh, it will not be closed because, uh, you know, as you know, in a fiction, uh, it's a new equilibrium, but it doesn't mean that it is the end of everything. But this time I shall take care to write on the credit that uh, any people believing that the story is not ended will be in charge to, to do <laughs> the, the follow-up of it. You know? It's a lovely idea. <laughs> Dot, yeah. dot, dot, to be continued. <laughs> but actually, uh, I'd just like to slow down one moment and, and to, to point at this extraordinary, I think quite unique phenomena in fiction making that uh, in 1983, you made Wen Cooney and it was at that time- 82, I think, 1982. 82, sorry. Uh, it, at that time, it was a, a single piece and it had a big effect. It was very popular at home and abroad. And isn't it true actually people use Wen Cooney to call their children the gift of God uh, yeah. sometimes, which they didn't before. Yeah. So it has an effect and a resonance in its culture. And then you return, I think about 15 years later to the same village yeah. and the same people and see, in, in some way intercept them into another passage from the, the, the story that you'd begun telling. Uh, I mean, there have been yes. documentaries made which meet the same people every seven years or five years or whatever, but it's really extraordinary to do this with the characters that we recognize when Cooney, Pun, I'm probably mispronounced, Puniere, and the mother and the friends in the village. This is a, a, a really uh, uh, unique exploration, I think. Yes, and the challenge is that uh, many of the characters, you know, I mean, the characters played by actresses and actors, those uh, artists, uh, many of them are uh, have uh, passed away. So uh -huh. it also it also brings uh, uh, you know, uh, concrete problems uh, in terms of narratives uh, that I have to resolve. But it's, it's interesting, you know, and also it shows me that, in fact, what I'm doing is not, uh, uh, the, the story doesn't belong to me personally. I think uh, I, I am trying to tell something that, uh, that, uh, 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 bring together all my my community, my my uh, my country, my continent. It's uh, certainly it could be seen like a kind of metaphor, also. But this is what is the most difficult: how you write it with uh, a concept and uh, going to a wider metaphor about life. You know. Uh, and it's very interesting. And you know, presently I am teaching, uh, you know, a group of fourteen people on on uh, script writing. And uh, while I am talking to them, while I am uh, trying to stimulate their writing, it's like I'm speaking to myself. And I hope that uh, after the end of the workshops, uh, finishing tomorrow, uh, it will uh, it will be. Um, a time for me after I, I, I have uh, uh, taken a little bit rest to, to write my own script. It's very interesting. You give, but you receive in the same time. And I, I like uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, momentum, you know. Augusto, I'm sure I am not alone in that many people will be pleased to hear you saying that yeah. and look forward to seeing that work. I mean, actually, yeah. you talk about the, the metaphor. I, I, yeah. I looked again, I've seen Budyam a little bit before, but I looked again at it yesterday. 
And yeah. the thing which really struck me in the opening moments are these yeah. two levels that as, as when Cooney um, is angry and upset about not uh, being able to find his father, that is an absolutely uh, you know, deep psychological state that one way or another, we don't have to be Freud to talk about Oedipus, but you know, the relation with the father is really important to most human beings. Yes. And then as he begins, it's a quest, a kind of philosophical quest into mm -hmm. what are we here for, where are we going? And so these two levels move together at the beginning of, of, the, of, of, of the film. I feel. Yes, 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 uh, exactly. And uh, what I want to do, you know, I was saying to my trainees, you know, the, the internships, that I would like to make the third uh, part of Wenkuni, that would be my fifth uh, long feature film. I would like to make it uh, as it is my first film in terms of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, simplicity in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, resources used to make the movie, you know? And of course, it, uh, it gives me a lot of, um, a lot of uh, insomnia, you know, because I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I would like it to be simple like a, 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 an oral storytelling, but I am working in film. So again, like I did for the Wen Kuni in 81, when I was about to start the shooting in October 81, I, I, I was dreaming to be able to, to tell it in a way that any, any uh, I would say, uh, common people in my country Will, uh, will immediately identify with the way I'm telling the story. You know, Budiam was, uh, I would say, into bracket, a, a, a more richer film that I cannot, I cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, find this money today. So I, I would like to tell it in a way that it resembles more to Wenkuni then to Budiam, even it will be, of course, the same uh, uh, rhythm and uh, I hope so. This is my dream, but you know, it's uh, the, 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 uh, the thing is that I, I would like people to see it and then we talk about, you know. That's that'll be very of, interesting when yeah, hopefully yeah. we have three to 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 compare. But I I wonder when you say uh, resources and budget because seeing um, Budiam uh, again, it just struck me that um, you know one of the levels. Ah, hi, we have Zach. I think coming to see us. Hi. Oh, okay. Hello, Zach, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I forgot about this. Great. I'm very okay. glad to, that you made it. And um, yeah. you talked with Gaston before. I'm glad to, to meet you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we were just talking in a bit more detail about Gaston's Budiam, so we'll finish that, but then move on to some of the connections. Um, that there are, you're, you're coming from very different places, but with so many things that connect and um, you could say the same, but different. Um, but I'll, if I may, I'll just finish uh, the, the thing I was saying with Gaston about um, production uh, values and, uh, and uh, money. I mean, there was a, a mad German avant-gardist called Klaus Viborni who once said, um, quality in cinema, quality is in inverse proportion to budget, <laughs> meaning the lower the budget, the better quality. But we, we leave that. We leave that. I, was uh, just say that I, I wish is I wish it is absolutely true. <laughs> uh, of course.
but I was going to say some of the richness of Budyam in comparison to, to Wenkuni was a visual richness, the blue and orange inside Punieri's uh, uh, room and the, 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 the green in the forest. And those surely, uh, uh, or the saxophone on the soundtrack, they are not necessarily the most expensive aspects of, of realizing a film. Visual not of course. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. But uh, the, 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 the crew, the, the, you know, the crew was a, a very large crew because it was a road movie. We need a lot of trucks only okay. to transport the two, the two right. horses, you know. We needed two trucks, you know, and uh, all uh, the people, the, the, you know, it was, uh, it was we were... Uh, we were uh, uh, joking about that with my, my uh, co-producer in France. It's a minor uh, co-producer, but when they, they received the, 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 the footages, you know, the, the rushes, and, uh, and uh, they, they have been the first ones to see the images. And one of them said, are you trying to make a new Lawrence of Arabia? You know, because they were when we shot uh, in the desert and things like that. So it 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 remained something very very um, uh, I would say uh, very pleasant among us. You know, because we we did uh, something uh, that was uh, that had what you say a, a very uh, uh, extreme. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, artistic value, you know. Uh, when I'm saying that, we, I would like to make it uh, uh, lighter it, because I know I will not have the money, but I hope that not even having the money, I shall be able with my crew to, uh, to keep, you know, the, the intensity, the density and, uh, or, and the poetry and, uh, you know, of the images, it's what we, I believe in. So of course, this is not uh, absolutely related to, to the money, but money helps to acquire the possibility of uh, working uh, very simply. You know, it's, it might appear to be paradoxical, but I, I, I am sure you understand what I mean. But even though I, I, I really would like to tell the story in a way that people say, how could he believe he can do that? You know, it's, it's my dream, I am dreaming. So I'm sharing with you my dreams, but I don't know in uh, which nightmare I'm going to enter when I shall start the shooting, you know? Uh, I think, uh... The, the, the Imagine is a, a, a dream as well, the, the song that led you to uh, um, name uh, your film school uh, Imagine. And so the dreaming is the right starting point. And also I remember a really um, wonderful uh, quotation from, I, I believe from Orson Welles, where he said, yes. absence of constraint is the enemy of art. Uh, finding yeah. ways, and I think um, I remember we we talked about you know the kind the way that you build a soundtrack and use music, which is actually yeah. in a much more simple way than the kind mm -hmm. of multi-track high software school of Walter Murch that you get in Hollywood for sure. Yes, yes, sure. Well, Zach, well, welcome. I'm glad to see you there. Shall we um, um, touch on some of the things? Because I know you had a, a kind of rehearsal discussion with Jamie and, uh, and Gaston uh, before. But, um, we, but we just began a few minutes ago by talking about the notion of the audience. And uh, I, I'm imagining from having seen some of your films that your audience also has a starting point in, in uh, your specific community, in, in, in the culture you live in. Hi, Zach. Hi, hi, <laughs> Gaston. Yes, um, yeah. Um, the, the press audience I have to impress, 
I have to impress my my people uh, because uh, they will tell me I'm doing it wrong or I have to do it this way. So that's my first audience is mm -hmm. to impress my people. Like the Ethnodrid story, the international story in the Arctic, the circumpolar. Uh, if I do it wrong, they will know I'm doing it wrong. Uh, so that's my first audience. If I impress them, then I let it open to the outside world. And if it could work with them, then maybe it's that's actually something which gives uh, you the confidence that it can work with wider audiences. I mean, I was in Cannes in 2001 when uh, Atan Arjuat, did I pronounce that? The Fast mm. Runner became a huge uh, uh, success uh, internationally. Uh, but the starting point is one, as with Gaston, in uh, uh, an actual concrete audience um, that is close to you, I, I guess. Um, um, shall we talk a little bit about uh, uh, the fast runner and, and the way that that evolved from uh, uh, an ancient myth and legend uh, in, in Inuit uh, uh, culture, is that right? Yes, I heard this story. It's a bedtime story. Uh, it's a story that your parents told you to put you to sleep. They, well, it happened to us too, but in our culture, we're all in the same room. We all sleep by si side, brothers and sisters and mom and dad. So they could be telling a story, well, we're in bed and, and some of us, we fall asleep. <laughs> Everyone doesn't know what happened. So the next night we're, we're asking mother to start, go back and start telling it again. And, uh, and when, you, when you hear this man running naked on the ice, mm -hmm. the, you picture it. I mean, people don't do that. People don't, um, especially up here uh, in the Arctic, uh, Inuit, we don't go swimming, we don't swim. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it was unforgettable sight. You imagine it, and then when you're trying to create it, when you're on set, uh, how do you shoot it? Uh, how do you shoot a naked man uh, on the ice? Um, so we knew, because we're following the script, um, and we know our actor, that his, his day is coming, he's gonna be naked, he's gonna, be absolutely naked. He knew that ahead of time. And that day came and, it, and we tried it. Uh, how we shoot it, we would put the camera on top of a sled mm -hmm. because we don't have tracks. We don't have track system. We don't, uh, and handheld that time, um, we haven't experienced handheld yet uh, with, a, with a camera person. So we mounted on the sled and we had six people pushing the sled, running beside the naked man. And every time we cut, we would go back because this one stretch of nice level patch of ice that we were shooting First of all, it would be his feet, and then would, second say it would be his face, and then wide. So we took, I don't know how many takes, it took us two days to do that scene, running running man, so. And to keep him warm for two days. Chance. Well, <laughs> we, we have popped in. We have popped in to warm him up and common stuff to, Gosh, Keep gosh. Mm -hmm. and, and of course you made an extraordinary uh, image that stays in everyone's mind. When did you first uh, hear the story? When you were a small child uh, in your family uh, uh, room? Uh, yeah, when I was very small. 
Um, I remember I got my first caribou when I was eight years old. Uh, I must have been like four or five years old when I heard the story because mm -hmm. after five years, you start going with the men. You start going hunting with the men. You're doing nothing, but you're going out learning and you start learning how to attend the dogs while the men are out hunting. Uh, yeah, you start learning very young. And um, you changed the story as you developed it uh, uh, into a script. You actually uh, uh, talked with the community about changes in advance, did you? Yes, we did. Um, because uh, the story is, everybody knows it. So uh, our late partner, Paul Hapak had, he interviewed eight elders telling the same story. So we're trying to get every little story we can get as far as stretch out, but the way in our culture, the way our elders tell the stories, it happened here, next thing it happened there. And so we had to create what's in between. We had to create a, create a bridge. So with this uh, scenes that we created, uh, because the story happens here and there and we bridge it and that's how we create and we went, when we asked the elders if it's okay to change the story of course they tell us stories are always changing and so these stories and it's the same with you Gaston these stories are not uh, owned there's no copyright on the story they are actually evolving stories that the community uh, possesses and passes on and changes them. Is that true for in both your uh, uh, societies, really? Yes, I believe so. It's uh, uh, because the, the tales are uh, originally made to educate, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the children and the, the youth, you know, how to behave in the society. That was, it doesn't mean that there is not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, artist, artistic values and poetry and uh, philosophy or whatever, but uh, it was primarily made to tell uh, stories. So it shapes the mind, it educates and all those things. So. I, I guess it, 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 it is, uh, uh, it, 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 it permanently changes, you know, in, uh, in the way. Uh, in the case of Wenkuni and Budiam, and the third part that I am uh, uh, hardly trying to write, uh, it was not a pre-existing story. I invented it, but I, I invented it and I made it with some, uh, Parts that I I took in my culture, so it it all is the reason why when they first saw when Kuni, they they uh, they felt themselves already owner of the story, even before they have uh, uh, finished seeing the, the 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 film, you know, and is the reason why. A lot of audience went 20, 12, 15, 20 times, you know, to, to, to see the, 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 the film because it's their movie. I, I incidentally made that movie, but the story of the movie uh, uh, was already uh, part of their belongings, you know, uh, in a way. It's, uh, it's, and, uh, and I think it's the best gift that an audience could give to a to a an artist when they uh, completely uh, adopt absorb you know like a pre-existing uh, uh, element of their own imagination you know uh, is the reason why they ordered me to make the second part and now the third part i hope i will 
I shall not disappoint them, you know? And so I, I know that uh, I cannot do something that pleases me uh, personally. I have to do something that speak, speaks to them in a true way, in a very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, multidimensional way. And this is what I am trying to find out, you know. Uh, but I, I agree that the details are made to, to, to be responding to the need of the community. So it might change as many times it should because it goes with the, the way that uh, the tradition, usually people oppose tradition and modernity. And I find out, probably I'm not the, the only one, but that what is modern today will become tradition tomorrow. So there is a dialectical link between tradition and modernity. One was born from the, the, the saga and permanently. So is the reason why I, I hope that one day someone in one of the filmmakers I've trained or whatever their, their, their grandchildren will make a movie that would appear to be a kind of sequel of Wen Kuni. You know, I shall be very honored even I am already in the other world, you know. So I have I, 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 I picked yeah. it up from both of you in, in the way that you've talked about the process of making that your starting point is entirely different from the uh, auteur, the uh, artistic ego of um, most Western directors in Europe and in America, which they see and understand themselves as expressing themselves. I mean, Bergman once talked about you pull the colored thread of imagery from your own unconscious, but it seems as though Zach and Gaston, both of you have a sense of stories circulating and not being the possession of uh, a, a single person, uh, the filmmaker as auteur. Would you say that as well, Zach, in some ways? Yes, because we're just learning about copyrights. I mean, <laughs> 60 years ago, when we were on the land, we didn't know anything about copyrights. The only closest copyright I could think of is because in, in our culture, in the art tech, where it's always ice and cold, uh, travel by dock teams, and there's no trees up here. There's no paper up here. There's no nothing to write on. So all these important agreements are done in the head. Marriages, important deals, uh, all of these are done in the head. So they never forget. Uh, if you have seen my recent film, One Day, uh, the, the government agent keeps asking, ask him again, ask him again. Uh, you know, it don't, I mean, they don't talk like that. Once they hear it, they get it. They don't have to be told five times to, to get it. Uh, Can I just say yeah, that? I, I copyright saw never. I saw the, well, uh, I, I know an Indian uh, filmmaker called Shahir Kapoor, who once was talking uh, at the uh, film festival, and he said, um, in India, for us, the meaning of the word copyright is the right to copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> can, can I just yeah. say, Zach, I, I saw your film one day in the life of, uh, uh, Noah Puikatuk, if I pronounce that. And uh, for me, it was absolutely an extraordinary moment when uh, the uh, Canadian with a small C uh, operative says, um, you know, we will come to the settlement, we will give you money and you can control money. And uh, uh, Noah and his compatriots say, 
what is money to us? <laughs> and that is a really extraordinary and radical thing to say in uh, an epoch entirely circulating around money and the use of money. And actually, it made me think, I mean, Gaston, in the village uh, uh, where you have placed your films, of course, people go to the market and something is bought with cowrie shit, but, the, but the, the community is not about money in the way that contemporary society has become, is that in, in a sense, maybe? Unfortunately, things are changing tremendously, you know. I would say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, more and more, money is a, is a central issue, you know, for the bad, uh, or the good, I don't know, but I, I, I don't want to be uh, to be uh, naive, you know. Uh, yeah. Today, money as uh, as a, a, a central uh, position, and sometimes even for people who are uh, city dwellers, uh, and uh, they they uh, in a kind of uh, of. Uh, uh, I would say uh, a, a, a poetical uh, way of seeing uh, the rural uh, people. Uh, they might be uh, surprised by some reaction. I think uh, there is a money is spoiling everything today, more and more, and particularly among the, the young people, you know, who are no more living in a single village because they have uh, uh, portable telephones, you know, they, they, they are connected. So they, uh, they, uh, they are unfortunately uh, invaded by all those, uh, those uh, new ways of, uh, of uh, uh, dealing uh, uh, between human beings, and uh, and uh, that that's one thing uh, that uh, strikes me a lot, you know. But in the same time, what to do when you are you are uh, a, a farmer and you need to buy petrol uh, for your uh, your uh, your uh, lamp, you know, or uh, you need to buy batteries for your uh, your uh, uh, we say in French torch. I don't know the word in English, you know. So unfortunately, for them, they cannot say money is not uh, uh, is not real. Money is real, and. Uh, and they are they are kept away of a lot of things because they don't have the money. So uh, I'm speaking particularly about the young people, and sure. it brings me to speak about how the criminals and the the violent extremists and the radicalists are able to attract the young people by giving them money, you know, and. Uh, motorcycles and things like that. So it's a real uh, transformation. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, avoid in, uh, in uh, sticking on that because it's the truth today, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's part of the reality uh, of life and it is part of the problems we have when the young people uh, not having jobs, you know, not seeing uh, any uh, uh, positive horizon in their lives, you know, are seduced by those people who have money and they take them uh, at the beginning in uh, giving money, portable telephones, motorcycles, and then suddenly they find themselves you know, becoming, uh, uh, they see themselves involved in, uh, in violent extremism and into 
the type of killings that we got uh, recently in Burkina, in the village of Solan, uh, or uh, the policemen, uh, the soldiers, and uh, the volunteers, uh, the civilian being volunteers, uh, to, to, to keep security in the countryside. They are killed uh, every day, unfortunately. And, uh, and uh, partly it comes from the corruption by money. So, I mean, the tragedies and massacres that have occurred recently, when they are reported uh, in Western media, are described purely in extreme religious terms as jihadis and uh, Islamists. But in fact, you, you're explaining that there are different layers of motivation yes. that play. Yeah. But uh, they, they are using even religion to, to cover the criminal things they are doing, for instance, you know. So but, it's a mixed, a mixed uh, 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 about a lot of things, you know, is the reason why the resolution is so difficult. It could not be only military answer, uh, but then what to do? while the other are uh, uh, doing what you know, called uh, the uh, asymmetric war, you know, uh, yep. asymmetric, yeah, it's, uh, so it's, uh, but I don't want us to be stalked by that, but really I think that money today is playing a very, very, very tragic uh, 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 role uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the remote places of our country. Maybe the, I same, could... the same in Mali and Niger, you know. So... I could just say that although the two films uh, that are in the festival this year, um, when Kuni and Budyam uh, don't do it, an earlier film that Gaston made uh, called San Boko deals with the encounter between the old rural culture and mo a modern uh, Ouagadougou, a modern uh, uh, city. But um, Zach, coming uh, uh, back to you, I mean, I think your reference to, uh, you know, just to question money is to set uh, uh, a really important agenda. I mean, as Gaston says, I don't think anyone is going to abolish money, but to even think of how we use it and what it does um, is, is really important. But looking at, at um, uh, the uh, day in the life of Noah uh, Pouet, I'm only going to stumble over the pronunciation. How should I say it? You got to. Thank you. you got to. You got to. Um, uh, which was shown in the festival last year, I think. Um, surely, in a way, that has uh, a, a kind of uh, immediate uh, resonance in contemporary um, debates because uh, it very clearly shows the way that uh, uh, a, a community was pushed into this or settlements and schools and the uh, scale of the tragedy and the scandal um, is only being revealed now in uh, Canada with a small c. <laughs> It is. In, in, in our culture, um, I think the closest thing to money was food. Um, if you're a good hunter, if you're a good uh, streamist, if you can sew, stitch animal hides into clothes, or if you're a good hunter, you're, you're, you're rich. You have everything. All you need is food. Uh, the introduction of money, I remember uh, when we were living off the land, uh, when we were learning English words. I remember one of the hunters came to our camp, brought in a box that he bought from the store. And he shoved it in and he said, he got this without paying, which means he charged for the foods that he bought. Well, I didn't understand that. How could you not 
pay and get tea, sugar, biscuits, and all the things you need. I didn't understand that. <laughs> that was in our, in our stone hut days. Uh, but now I understand it because I live with my MasterCard and I swap that MasterCard <laughs> to buy things that I don't even pay for and I get them, which is exactly uh, When money was introduced to us, um, they did not introduce to us about inflation. They never said things get, uh, the price get higher and higher in the years to come. Nobody told us that. So nobody told us about inflation. They promised $2 houses, which is now about $1,500 houses now. Uh, yeah, but when I came in late when you were talking about money, uh, I know, I know, it, we need money to make film. Uh, but when I made Atanandu, uh, I only had close to $2 million. The next project I did was uh, the journals of Knut Rasmussen, uh, which had $6 million budget, which didn't do any better than the first one. So from my experience, uh, the more money you have, it doesn't make the film better to me. It's the story. It's a story that makes it better. That, that, that's for me. I just made a, a stop motion uh, 20 minute piece with people who work in stop motion. Um, uh, I'm kidding. It's still a moment. Someone's got Sorry. a phone on. <laughs> okay. Look at, I'll take that call. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi. Look at. Who can look to a room? Who can look to a room? Jump good. Okay, Tema. Okay, bye. This is the uh, proof that it's a live conversation, I think. Yeah. <laughs> But okay, yeah. just talk about the way you changed the story, Zach, because you went back to the elders in developing the script and you actually mm. specifically softened the ending. Is, it, is, is that a way, uh, a reasonable way to, to understand it? Yeah, uh, um, and we know, we know these stories. If, our, if there's a revenge done, the other family will revenge and then down the road, the other family will revenge. Um, we know these revenging stories that they never end. Mm. So uh, in Atanadjot, we were going through time uh, in the world that uh, we were, there was a fight going on and, and we knew uh, if we don't stop the killing, it was not gonna stop. Uh, so in our story, we, we knew that if we don't stop the killing, uh, it was not going to stop. So in Atanandu, uh, we changed this ending story where Atanandu just didn't kill him. He just banged to the side of him uh, with his bat. Um, and he said, the killing stops here. Uh, we created that. I mean, in the story, he kills them, he smashes them. And, because they're bad guys. But in our story, uh, it's, we stopped the killing. Uh, and the elders um, were, were uh, happy to uh, see uh, a different version and a different change that, that, that you developed for the, for, for the film. Yes, every story is told differently. And every story has two sides to it. Uh, so yeah, elders were didn't complain to us. And uh, uh, Gaston, you saw the Fast Runner, didn't you? You've watched the um, um, Zach's uh, uh, film. Uh, what did you uh, make of it as uh, uh, a story emanating from uh, uh, Inuit myth? Yeah, I, I, I told when I. 
I saw the films. I I gave my uh, my uh, feeling to Jami, and I was saying that I was very moved by the the uh, you know uh, the, the the stories you know of the people, uh, and uh, and uh, also the way that Zach has succeeded to match the landscape and the story. It's like the landscape itself was uh, a character, you know. I, I, I like this very much, you know, and it was not, uh, you know, advertisement pictures, but it was uh, uh, picture scenes uh, by, a, by a, an indigenous filmmaker, you know, I think uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, there is a, a sentiment of, of truth about the way uh, the story is told in that uh, special, uh, special environment, you know, I liked it very much and, and the acting, I, I, many times you can believe that people were not even acting, you know. Uh, so that's something that I appreciate uh, uh, enormously, you know. It's uh, it's uh, and I I hope sometime uh, Zach uh, will come in the tropical country of mine <laughs> to show his his films, you know, because uh, it will speak to the young filmmakers also that uh, they, they, uh, their stories, stories about their people are, uh, uh, you know, uh, matter a lot, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's important that we, we, we are able to tell those stories because it constitutes, it constitutes uh, a patrimony, you know, uh, that will be, uh, that will miss to the coming generations if we don't do it today. That's, that's how I have seen the, the, those films. And I said, we, we still need to tell, you know, rooted stories because it speaks about not only us, not only, but it speaks about humanity in fact, you know. Yeah, the quest in, in uh, when Kuni and, and Budyam and the story of uh, power and jealousy in the fast runner, these are, uh, are things which in different forms occur uh, yeah. uh, universally, really. Um, can I just ask a small thing between the two of you? Both of you mostly or completely use non-professional actors, which is part of the texture and authenticity. Is that... Sometimes, Gaston, don't you use people who work in theater sometimes a bit? Or are they all from the village where you filmed? Uh, not, not necessarily from the village, you know. We are using the extras. Most of the extras are from the village, of course. But the, the main characters are played by uh, some people who are uh, acting in, uh, in theater already or or they have already kind of experience in film. But you know, uh, just uh, a small anecdote. Uh, you know Tenga. Tenga is the guy who played in uh, Wenkuni, in Zamboko, and Rabi. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even uh, people in Burkina, they are always questioning, but who is this peasant? Uh, while uh, Joseph Nikema, this is the real name of the actor. He used to be a, a, a professor of natural sciences. <laughs> in the, yeah, you see. So he is able even to confuse my people who see really a farmer, you know, and they were, they were uh, uh, astonished in a way to see a farmer able to play so well in the movie <laughs> while it was, it was not a farmer. So I mean, I trust really my people. And I always say to them, even when they are acting, 
because they are coming from theater, the first thing that you have to, to do is to refrain them in acting too much, you know? And when you succeeded in that, everything rolls okay. And uh, I used to tell them, I was, I closed my eyes, but I can see from what I heard uh, coming from your mouth that you didn't act right, you know? And they were always uh, surprised when I say them that. And I say, no, you need the words to come from your stomach, you know? Then it will be more, you know, trustable, more credible that uh, when you just speak from your, your mind and your mouth, you know, that's, uh, so I think it's, it's a question of uh, mutual confidence, you know, when you work with the guys and you, you are able to explain them what you would like to obtain from them and you need them to, to bring their parts. So sometimes it's simply amazing the, the, uh, the, the precision and uh, the, 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 the toughness of their, 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 the way they act, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, Zach, and you, what's your approach to working with actors, uh, most of whom I am presuming are non-professionals? Well, yeah, but uh, what I try to do is I try to keep it in my community uh, because um, if we if we go 200 miles out, it's a different dialect. So, uh, I try to keep it uh, in my community, and I'm very picky. Like <laughs> I'm very picky at faces uh, because I'm looking for a traditional face. Uh, if it's mixed with other culture, uh, I usually don't want it. I want the real, real breed. I would say, um, and then getting your actors to become actors uh, was something that we trained them to how to how, how to get into a character i mean if i'm playing a character who's very lazy so i have to be really lazy uh, i have to get myself mentally i have to get in myself into the character. And we train our actors to do that. Uh, Non-professionals, uh, I mean, what do you have to be professional? You have to go to a professional school. I mean, if you go to that professional school, you're gonna go into one kind of standard. But, um, but if you play characters, that's what you learn. If you're learning a bad, bad guy, you become a bad guy. Uh, so that's what we train our uh, actors to do, is to get themselves into character. Uh, and then when they act, they're not them, they're playing the character and it's just what we want. I must say, I'm interested in your, your saying, uh, that you're looking for a specific face because in a way in uh, a day in the life of Noah it's uh, it's actually his face that is the refutation of the attempt to uh, make him submit and assimilate in a, in in, in uh, uh, the settlement it, his face is the answer when you move into the close-up with his face mm -hmm. uh, for me that's a kind of uh, refutation um, and it's very moving when in the end you use a piece of documentary footage I mean I'm not sure where documentary and fiction stop but uh, at the end of your film you actually have some material of, of the original man um, from 1991 it's very moving by the end of the film very very moving <laughs> um, I, I thought we should, because we, we, we uh, have have talked for a little time, I, we should ask if there's anyone um, 
uh, listening or participating who has uh, a question which um, they could put in the chat column and I could ask Zach or Gaston um, to address it. Uh, I think it would come up in the chat column if there is anything um, uh, that anyone wants to ask, please do that. Um, Zach, did you see any of Gaston's films earlier? Have you had a chance to see them? Yes, I did. I saw one of them. It's about this Coke bottle. Is that one of your work? Which which is the, that? The, the, the which Coke one? bottle. The Coke bottle. Oh. They drop it from. Is that not not you? Uh, this. I I, the one I, I not saw. Really... Ah. What what does it tell as a story? Because the story? title doesn't. It starts with this plain pilot who drinks Coca Cola, and then he no. throws it out. That's not yours. No. <laughs> I thought that was. Absolutely I thought not. that was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was brilliant, brilliant yeah. idea. Uh, when they start to use that Coke bottle for cooking, for working, and then they fight over this. Bottle and then he wanted to take it back and he ah. to, to oh, this, is, this is God made must in, be uh, crazy. Yes, God must God be must crazy. Be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was your way. <laughs> uh, I am not that crazy yet. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, if I don't think we have any written uh, questions coming in, but um, if uh, either of you have anything uh, further to add, we should um, uh, we should be pleased to hear it. Um, if not, we'll probably uh, go our different ways um, on our different continents. Uh, Gaston, Zach, anything that you want to say at this point? Um, I'm happy to say that um, right now we have our own channel. We have our own cable channel uh, in Canada uh, through Shaw, uh, where when I started, I was having so much trouble showing my work. And I would take it to networks and they would want, they would tell me, it's what kind of language is that? Uh, you dub it to English, we'll show it. And I know that I've seen Kung Fu movies. I knew that if I dub my Atanadio into English, it was, it was gonna look like a bad Kung Fu movie. So uh, stick on to my language and stick on to subtitling. Um, that this way you can hear my language and yet understand it. Uh, yeah, that's what I've been working on, and it seems to work. It works. And Great to hear it. Place to show it. Very good. I guess so. You haven't quite managed to take over our our, our BF uh, television uh, yet in Burkina Faso, have you? But um, no, with with the, the what they call TNT, there are uh, many many uh, televisions that. Uh, were born, but I, I want to to give uh, this uh, short story. You know, during the confinement, you know, uh, because of COVID nineteen, um, the government asked uh, all the filmmakers uh, to to give their their productions, and they uh, all the televisions have uh, transmitted for free. Uh, the our, our works, you know, and uh, during uh, uh, it was uh, during uh, huh? during three months. Uh, I was asking to Toussaint to confirm me the duration of that period. During three months, all the films have been shown again, and you know, many people haven't yet seen the movies for some reasons. They were. Uh, traveling or they were uh, too young 
and uh, there were kids. And so during the, those three months, most part of the production of uh, films in Burkina uh, has been transmitted and people liked it very much. You know, it has, it has contributed to create a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, yeah, may, may I say uh, cohesion, cohesion among the people. And that, that proved, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the power of images, you know, and uh, it was, uh, it was, and people, people can, uh, can uh, realize that when the filmmakers want to make films and they are asking for money, it means something because uh, it, 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 uh, it participates to the way that we are, we are reflecting our lives, you know, on the screen, you know, and they calculated how many billions the state should have uh, uh, spent to acquire the right to, to show all those films. And it was more than three billions of our money, you know, that, that is, uh, yeah. And, and that is something that, uh, that uh, gave, uh, gave uh, a kind of uh, a new uh, view of the fact that we, we have to tell our own stories because people are starving. People have a vital need of their own stories and images, you know. And uh, so in that, in that way, we can say that uh, uh, something happened during the COVID and that was a very uh, particular experience of all the nation watching the same films at the same period of time. Uh, it, there are some extraordinary effects that have occurred in the last 18 months and the connection across uh, uh, nations and, and cultures is, is, is one of them. Zach, I was going to ask you, Jamie was saying that you talked about, you know, the way in which your work reaches the people. Um, is your sense now that that is more possible via television than cinema? or cinema on television at least? Is that the route that you are now um, in uh, exploring? Are you done? Are you asking me? Is that, uh... huh? Zach, did that come through? Could you hear that? Yeah, I'm starting to break up here. Um, in Canada, we have a system. Uh, my internet is no good. Yeah, it's breaking up a little bit. Okay. Uh, yes, I can do it. Yeah, it's the gap, although actually, uh, uh, ironically, it's relevant to this discussion of cinema and television, because during the uh, pandemic, so many more people have moved more quickly towards streaming as a form of television rather than uh, the old linear transmission. And so uh, films and programs are watched in a slightly different way in our own homes and in our own time, I think. Ah, I think Zach's come and gone. Um, but that is the effect of um, using the internet as the uh, communication medium, I suppose. Um, Gaston, uh, unless there's anything else to say, we should probably all say goodbye and go in our different directions. Yeah. But I've been very grateful uh, for your and Zach's uh, participation in this discussion. Uh, Jamie, do you want to come in as it's the end of the festival as a whole? Do you want to say anything about that? 
Yes. Uh, well, first thing I should just thank uh, Gaston and Zach for yet another wonderful conversation. That's been just so fantastic to, to eavesdrop on and, and just to hear so many, so many kind of wonderful observations and insights. And thank you also to you, Rod, for, for chairing uh, so incisively and so so graciously. It's been a really wonderful session. Uh, and just to say thank you really to all of our audience, whether they are with us right now or whether you are watching this, catching up on this after the fact. Um, it's been really an impossibly rich week of, of, of discussion. And it's been an enormous privilege really for us to be able to bring together some of whom I consider to be the most significant filmmakers working in the world today. And, you know, it's such an enormous honor not only to have directors of the stature of Gaston and Zach with us, but to be able to bring them together. And so it's been truly an enormous privilege for us. And we are, we are so grateful to our filmmakers, to our musicians, uh, to everyone else who has participated in the discussions. And we are also, uh, of course, very grateful to our audiences. So thank you to you for coming along uh, and, and engaging. Um, and of course, the Folk Film Gathering will be back next year, and we hope in person. We hope finally that, you know, that Zoom has enabled some amazing mm. conversations across the world. I mean, who would have thought that we could have brought together Wagadougou, Igloo Lick, Rod, I believe, is somewhere in Galway. Is that right, Rod? Just, uh, yeah, the west coast of Ireland. West coast of Ireland. South of Galway and various, various places in Scotland. So, I mean, you know, just amazing really what technology allows us to do. But I think that equally, um, there's a, a much that we miss from the, the kind of convivial warmth of being in the same room together. And I think that one of the great sadnesses and, and you know, that great sadness is just about to, to come now, is that when these, when these conversations end, I press the red button on Zoom, and that is it. <laughs> you know, if we were, if we were at, a, at a festival together, the conversation would spill onwards. We would be able yeah. to, to yeah. continue talking. We would be able to kind of continue the conversation. So it's a great sadness, really, that, that you know, one presses the red button and that's it. So but we'll meet again. Old Lang Syne type thing. We will meet again. And it, it is my great hope that in the future that we will be able to invite Gaston, and Zach to continue this conversation in person in Edinburgh, or perhaps it'll be in Wagadougou, who knows? But um, yeah, I very much look forward to the moment when we can all be in the same room together. So yeah, a final word of thanks everybody before I press the red button. It's just been a wonderful festival and this conversation in particular has been very, very rich and I've incredibly enjoyed listening to it. So thank you very much once again to Gaston. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And just, uh, just a bye thanks bye. to our captioners as well, to Karen and Louisa and to my great colleague, Mark David for all of his efforts over the past week. Thank you all so much and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. Here we go. Thank you for arranging everything, Jamie. Thank you, Gaston. We will speak soon, I hope. Goodbye. Okay. Yeah.